sorry, there's a certain amount of mastery here in this new venue. But here we are again, and the audio is not working. Can I run the long arm of the law? We can hide out for a while, he says with a smile. But you can't outrun the long arm of the law. Okay, good. We, we got it working. Uh, well, good morning and welcome to the sixth session of the Long Arm of the Law, and thanks to Katina for thinking these topics are so important that uh, she makes sure we get a certain amount of airtime for them each year. Uh, every year we pick a topic or a court case or something that we're going to follow in this session that will be of value to many, many in the audience, librarians, publishers, and others. Uh, this year we decided to focus on privacy, which is a topic that is touching us all in every layer of our lives. Privacy is the ability to control into whose hands information falls. It is important because it protects the rights and freedoms of all of us to live as we please. Our speakers today are bringing to us important perspectives about privacy in the library and the publishing and other settings. I'm going to be very brief with these introductions. We're going to just run through them all very quickly. Uh, the speakers will each take about 15 minutes, and then with good luck, we'll have some time left over for audience discussion. Our first speaker is Gary Price, who is known to you uh, in many ways for his work with Library Journal, keeping us all informed and up to date with InfoDocket. He's going to speak about technologies that libraries and publishers use, deploy, often inadvertently, and how they might compromise our privacy. The other day, Gary told me that my most frequently used airline, United, doesn't encrypt their uh, itinerary information enough, and it might be possible for people to, who, who care to do this to find out where I'm going, and that freaked me out. So, uh, so Gary is going to talk about things like that. His, his mission here is to put the fear of God into, into our minds as we go forward. Uh, Bill Hene, who is a repeat regular offender here and one of our most popular speakers, is going to talk about the larger legal context, continuing uh, a topic that he started last year, which was the right to be forgotten. And then Lisa Macklin, whoops, I've forgotten to advance slides, that's not good. There, that's Bill. Uh, and Lisa, this doesn't often respond as quickly as you think it will. Uh, Lisa is going to bring the discussion directly into the academic setting and uh, discuss uh, things that will be of issue in our library context. So that is our lineup for this morning, and we thank you for being here. We hope there's something in here of value to everyone. So Gary. All right. Thank you, Anne. Good morning, everyone. Uh, to continue with the Kenny Rogers theme, hopefully by the end of this you won't call me coward of the county. <laughs> no, that didn't work, did it? Okay. Um, I'm here to put the fear of God in you, and hopefully in the next 12 minutes we'll do some of that and also impart some useful knowledge with you as well. Um, so let me turn on the slides. So library and internet privacy, and let's scroll. So the bottom line's at the top. Awareness by all parties, discussion, education and our, is a must and needed now. And I lost, this, I lost something there. But I wanted to say this, that the privacy the people expect from the library and have come to expect from the library over many, many decades is not where it should be in the digital age. Um, and we need to do more. The first place to begin is with discussion, education, and knowledge of first ourselves and then our users. Some of the good news is that there is work being done by many organizations now. In the last couple of years, we've seen interest from NISO. They have a privacy initiative. The American Library Association uh, just released ebook privacy guidelines, for example. And there's another um, funded project from the Knight Foundation called the Library Freedom Project. Um, we're also seeing more publishers getting involved. Um, 
some examples are in, in database providers. Biblio Commons, Project Muse, Overdrive, Biblio Board are all now encrypting the entire process, which includes the personally identifiable data, the, uh, your name if you have to register, but we're also, what I'm talking about is also the transmission of data over the internet, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. A pro but privacy is more than encryption. It is the local data. How is it stored? The transaction logs. Is the data being scrubbed? How often? Uh, does your library, and I've seen this in some of my research, privacy policies on, from some libraries haven't been updated in years. Is your library doing that? Are you disclosing what's going on in a clear manner, not on page 43 of some statement? Um, what are we doing with sh sharing with vendors? Um, we, we can share with vendors some of the things that Catherine was talking about. We can use some of this data, but we, sh we need to let our users know what's going on. We ask transparency of others, but we're not doing the job that we're asking of others. We need to do a better job. Same going with data storage. There are third parties involved. The library is just not a single building now. The data is flying all over the place. What, are your re what is your relationship with your with the vendors, what are their privacy policies? What is, how will they contact you? Will they contact you? How, and how long after there might be a data breach? Is the technology configured correctly? Opt-in services the vendors provide, what are they doing with that data? Um, if you're emailing results to a group of people, is that data being saved? If it is, how is it being scrubbed after X amount of days? Is it just immediately disappearing? We need to understand these things and, and work with our vendors on these types of issues. Um, is there a response, plan, a response plan in place locally that if there is a data breach, what will happen? So it's, a way, it's awareness, training, staying current, and being vigilant because all of this changes on a very regular basis. I also have seen over the last few years that p perhaps we're a bit scared of what might happen, but in my view, that's kind of burying your head in the sand. And in this day and age, we can lose a lot of respect from the general public and our users for something that they respect us for, being a pillar of privacy in our communities with just one simple data breach and the fact that they could, somebody could easily say, well, you never told us. So I believe in this day and age, we need to be out front on these issues. Again, transparency that we ask of others, we need to become better at in this particular uh, topic. Uh, we need to be preemptive versus reactive. Um, if just about every European website can have a cookie disclaimer on it, something that simple, why aren't we doing the same thing? For example, uh, when somebody borrows a book from an e-book provider and puts it on their Kindle, that data is being shared with the third party. Are we simply even disclosing this to our users? And one thing that I have also learned over the last few years is every has, everybody has a different level of comfort with privacy. So if somebody doesn't want their data stored indefinitely with Amazon, are we showing them how to remove the data off of the Amazon server? Are we providing them that information? Uh, from what I've seen, we need to do a better job. Now, we can talk about all the ethical reasons and why we need, and, and uh, this is what we've always done reasons, but put all those aside for a moment. In the last few years, privacy, data surveillance, and the like has become a major topic both in the U.S. and around the world. This, my belief is that privacy, library privacy and privacy in general, can be a wonderful marketing opportunity for us as a community to show our relevancy, something we're always looking to do, with an issue that a lot of people are talking about and interested in. For example, the community campus can be a privacy clearinghouse and leverage respect for our past efforts and public respect. So I'm going to skip through these. Now I'm going to show you a little bit of a live demo. Let me scroll through this here. And we'll go over here. So here it is, ladies and gentlemen. This is a, your term for this part of the presentation is sniffing. And this is an open source tech piece of technology that I am on a on a level from one to 10, on a scale from one to 10, I'm probably a two or three at. You can take intensive classes on this. This tool called Wireshark has conferences to keep people update. But in a nutshell, this is all of the Wi-Fi traffic flowing through this room right now. You can break it down and actually see sometimes 
if it's unencrypted, what somebody is doing. So, and then some, so I will, now with the next tool I'll show you, makes it a little bit easier to see what I'm talking about. This is a piece of software, again, open source, developed by a student at Iowa State University. Instead of writing a master's thesis paper, he developed this software. This takes all the data coming off, of all of the unencrypted cookies coming through Wireshark and makes them much more easy to view without having to have a master's degree in that particular product. And this is how one of the tools that I learned that uh, Anne's airline and another European airline is sending data unencrypted, including the passenger's last name and their passenger record number over the internet unencrypted, which I found to be rather shocking. So here are all of the people on Wi-Fi on the network right now. There's probably more, but this is what we're seeing right now. Now you're going to say, well, Gary, so what if I'm learning that you're searching X library and it says that uh, you're looking up whatever? Well, another thing that's going on right now especially when you're thinking of government surveillance and surveillance by others, is that whatever you're doing, this tool also gives you, here's somebody searching books.google.com, this tool also is identified with the exact, what's called the MAC address, the unique ID of that person's computer or electronic device. So there's two pieces of data. There is no one holy grail of data. In this day and age, having enough distinct data points can, makes it relatively simple to figure out who that specific person is. So you can see now people are what they're looking at. Somebody's looking at the CBC, that kind of thing. So those are the two particular tools. Let me go back to my slides for a moment and give you a couple of actual examples. Am I scaring the heck out of you? So. Now this is one slide, Let's see if I can do this here. Can you see this right here? I'm not gonna make this one too big. One of the, here's, a, here's a practical tip for you, especially for those of you who own Apple devices. Very often your device is named after you, so one of the things floating through is not just that MAC address, but is your specific name, and you can see that here. Um, play from current slide. You can see that somebody named Jeff W., I, I blinked at his full name, was on the Wi-Fi yesterday at one of the conference hotels. See where I'm going with this? It's these distinct, it's a number of these distinct data points merged together, which can be easily done now, makes it very simple to figure out who someone is, where they are. Another thing that we're dealing with now all over the internet are things called tracking scripts and beacons. These are pieces of code embedded in the web page that can provide all sorts of data. Again, these are the types of analytics we were talking about earlier. Whether or not it's a good thing or bad thing, that's up to the organization. But my point is sharing that, gaining the knowledge and sharing this, what's going on with our users. Also now we're seeing beacons used in a mobile setting, allowing people to be tracked throughout the store or throughout the library. If, if your library is doing that, what are you doing with that data after the person walks out of the library? And are you informing them in the first place that that's going on? Also, your IP address can share a lot of information with you. Uh, in this case, uh, in my hotel, you were able to see specifically where I am. I'm in, this IP address is tied to Charleston, South Carolina. But I've also been in locations where it not only says that you're in this city, but it says where in the city you're at. You're in the lobby, for example, of the Mayflower Hotel in Washington, D.C. This is, again, more of a specific example of the cookie uh, cager tool I just showed you. Here I am, 9CF3, and here I am searching the Library of Congress OPAC, and you can see all, this, all the search suggestions as I'm typing in. All of that is being sent over the Internet unencrypted. Here is another view of that data. You can see the refer says I was looking at loc.gov uh, uh, LOC and then my search term. This is another example. In this person, in this case, the Google Analytics was sharing, sorry, was sharing that this person was coming from library.caltech.edu. This by itself isn't a bad thing. But the, again, my point, my takeaway from this is we, one, need to understand what's going on first and then share that data with our users. Here is an example of a PubMed search, and you probably can't see it from here, but you can see all of my search terms in the specific data fields I was searching. So 
become privacy literate, first step, it needs to be a major part of my view of any digital library, a digital literacy campaign that you're doing. Awareness of tools and concepts to minimize exposure. So I've shared some of those with you. I know Lisa's going to talk. We're, we're, hopefully we'll have time to talk about some of the things that you can do if this is an issue for you at the library level, but also it, for an individual. Remember, this is very... Uh, everybody's got a different threshold of comfort. There are tools that you can do that while you can't, I, I would never get up here and say you can be completely private online and I can guarantee it. There are tools to let's say put roadblocks up to make it a little bit more challenging to get to some of this data. It's not rocket science to use them. Stay current, things change quickly, we all know that. Uh, discuss issues with colleagues and our users. There's a lot of ethical issues which we'll get into it moving forward. Um, and then teach our colleagues and users. I've also, on the slide deck that you'll get, include some other examples. This, for example, uh, article, Exposing the Hidden Web, an analysis of third-party requests on one million websites, was just published in the past month. So again, um, I promised I would go a little bit short to stay on schedule. I want to make Anne a happy lady. But this, again, is all of the Wi-Fi, all of the... And by the way, one final comment. If... These types of tools, Wireshark and Cookie Cager, don't just work on Wi-Fi. You could plug an Ethernet cable on here and get the same type of data as well. So, uh, we'll, answer, we'll have questions later. Thank you very much for your time and attention, and I hope I've scared you just a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see, we'll get started as soon as I figure out where my program is. Yeah. This thing? Push the green button. Oh. Oh, it's not here. Okay. All right. And that's an important lesson for everyone is to always know where to look. Okay, <clears throat> so the title of my program is Please Remember to Forget. Catchy, right? I'm sure you will remember this because this program, my little section, is all about forgetting. And the larger topic is, you know, where's all this privacy stuff going? Is it going to get into a flood or is it just a ripple? So we'll talk a little bit about this. Um, <clears throat> As I mentioned last year, Europe, the European Union, is very big into privacy issues. And in particular, unlike the United States, they have a very broad-reaching data privacy statute. It's called a directive, but it's effectively a statute. And its idea is to, is to um, protect individuals in the processing of data about them. Uh, and what they focus on is personal data. Now, personal data actually has a very broad definition in Europe. Uh, any information relating to an individual, any individual, any information, whether it relates to personal, private, professional life, it can be a name, it can be a photo, it can be an email address. They don't have social security numbers over there, but if they did, social security numbers, um, medical history, and really anything about them, particularly if it happens to be of a deleterious nature. And why are they concerned about this? A great quotation from the, uh, from the uh, um, uh, memo written in the uh, European Union government with social networking sites cloud computing, location-based services, and smart cards, we leave digital traces with every move we make. Gary just showed you some of your traces, all you in the audience who are just buzzing around the internet while you're supposed to be listening to us. <laughs> 
So we need a robust set of rules to make sure people's rights to personal data protection is made effective. Uh, I kind of admire the European Union government because they have apparently a sense of humor. This is actually an official government cartoon that's on their data privacy website. So here's, here's a, uh, you know, looks like a student going into the free internet cafe and coming out uh, embarrassed and totally naked because of the information that this person has logged on to the internet doing an internet search. Uh, I, am, I am reminded uh, of going into a library one time uh, a couple of years ago and waiting in line to talk to uh, a, a human being who was a reference librarian. Uh, and there was a young person, looked like a high school student, standing, talking, kind of whispering to the reference librarian, whisper, whisper, and the, li the librarian sort of leans back and say, Mildred, where do we keep the stuff on sex change operations? Um, so, uh, you know, uh, information about oneself can be uh, disclosed in a number of ways. Uh, you may remember last year we talked about a man named Mario Costeja Gonzalez. Uh, and he asked Google to take down some information about him, that is, take, remove it, as in take down, um, because this deleterious information, this negative information about him, had long since ceased to be accurate, and it was embarrassing. If you did a search on his name, you would come up with this couple of articles about the fact that he had had, well, actually, I won't mention it because I don't want to publicize what his problem was, but uh, he, he wanted this taken down. And they said, oh, no, we couldn't do that. So he goes to the government agency in Spain and asks them to make Google take this down. So they enter an order, Google appeals it, it goes all the way to the European Court of Justice, which is on a regional basis like our United States Supreme Court. It's the highest court in Europe. And the, uh, and the court uh, affirms the order of this, uh, uh, of this uh, Spanish privacy agency and, and makes Google take this down. But more than that, not just fix the problem for Senior uh, Costeja Gonzalez, but to actually order Google to set up a whole system to do this for anyone who is subject to the data privacy laws uh, or the, the protections of it. So, so what, the, what they ordered was that Google remove from the list of search results any web page links relating to an individual if such information is irrelevant in relation to the purposes for which the data was collected. And they, they said you have to balance individual rights against, uh, against the sort of collective rights of the public to know things. So they actually, they, Google, have set up this system and there's a request form here that uh, uh, you, can, uh, you, know, you can go on the, on the website and say, well, I'd like you to take down, the remove the following information. Um, and they have been, this process has been used an enormous amount in the past year. Um, as of this week, uh, over 338,000 requests have been filed with Google in Europe to remove information from 1.2 million URLs. Um, and of those, 42% have actually been remove these, these search results. Now, understand what that means is it's not whatever the URL is, has been removed from, from the Internet. It's, it's that Google's results will not produce that URL. You can maybe still find it some other way if you happen to know it, but you can't search for it. Um, and so you know, almost 10,000 URLs the listing of them was removed from, from Facebook, 5,200 from YouTube. Um, so, for example, here, here's one that the UK, uh, in the UK, someone said, well, I'd like to have you remove a report about a minor crime that I was involved with. And Google did remove it. And then the newspaper that, the, that had reported it 
uh, originally, then, sent, then filed a news report about the removal of the, and Google took that one down too. So they, uh, you know, the long arm of the law extends uh, on, on a continuing basis. Um, so the EU is actually thinking of strengthening this whole process and reaffirming this right to be forgotten. Um, they, they prepared an elaborated uh, directive in 2012. Uh, uh, just a few months ago, the Council of, of Justice Ministers in Europe uh, approved it, and um, it'll now go to the EU Parliament uh, and the broader Council for, uh, for further action, and I ex expect that it will be enacted. It, just, it, it, it addresses a number of things, not just right to be forgotten, um, but they, they have uh, reinforced the notion that if an individual no longer wants their personal data processed uh, and there's no legitimate reason to keep it, then it should be removed. But this proposal recognizes something which was somewhat unclear under the prior codification is that um, this is all subject to uh, a careful balancing of the right of freedom of expression for newspapers to print articles. And so even though a, a newspaper may be required to take it down or, the, or Google's research will not find it, um, that has to be taken into account. Uh, here's a statement um, uh, recently from the, the uh, uh, EU Justice Commissioner, uh, sort of like the equivalent of our Attorney General. The right to be forgotten is not an absolute right. There are cases where there's a legitimate reason to keep data in a database. Archives in a newspaper are a good example. It's clear that the right to be forgotten cannot amount to a right to rewrite or erase history. Uh, again, a balancing of the public's rights against private rights. So uh, to update you uh, on, on this thing, it, it's not only are there the hundreds of thousands of requests that are, that are going, it now is beginning to impact in the United States because a French uh, agency has ordered Google to take down information, to remove, to delist information from its US-based website, from Google.com. Not just Google.es or Google.fr uh, in Europe, because they've been doing that. But now this French court says, in order for this to be fully effective, this whole right to be forgotten thing, you have to take it down everywhere that you Google have a website. And so if you've got Google.com in the US, it's got to come out of that too, because someone in Europe could link to Google.com and do the search, which would otherwise be prohibited uh, in Europe. Um, the, the logic of this is uh, it's an evasion otherwise. Well, Google is, is not taking this lying down. They're going to appeal to the European Court of Justice again. Um, they've said, we're not going to do this. And so we're, you know, we're going to take the heat and we're going to go on appeal because you don't have any jurisdiction. And, and what the French agency says is, well, it's not a question of jurisdiction over the United States. What we're saying is, if you have a website somewhere else and someone in Europe can link to it, then you've got to to carry the right to be forgotten all the way through those websites. So um, what is the significance of that to us in the United States? Well, if they're compelled to take out information, take, to take down, to remove, to delist information that you would otherwise be able to find in the United States, it will no longer be available to you. Uh, and, and, and this is in order to protect the rights of someone in Europe. In the U.S., we don't have the right. We can't ask Google to take down negative information about us. If there was a copyright violation, we could ask them to do that, but not privacy. But if you're going to do a search uh, on, on Google.com, there will not be as much information there as there once was. And so it does impact us in the United States. Um, 
So uh, just to close here, um, I just want to explain how if you have something to hide, you can now take steps and then safely say, the light is green, the web is clear, so if you want to go surfing, dear, I'm delighted, I'm delisted, I'm de-googled. <laughs> I understand the reason why you're curious and just want to pry. You're de-nosy, you're de-snooping, you're de-peeping. You can tell at a glance that the EU has taken a stance. You can hear their court of justice murmuring low. You'll never know. So please be sweet, my chickadee. And when you ask me, I'll say to thee, it's delightful, it's delisting, it's debatable, it's deletable, it's defensive, it's deliberate, it's deleted, it's de Google. So that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> I do have to tell you that I once sent a friend of mine a birthday card that said, in honor of your birthday, I will not sing. <laughs> and so I will not sing, and you should be very grateful for that. So I'm going to talk to you about privacy in libraries and really try and take what um, Gary and Bill have said and kind of bring them back into our um, everyday lives, if you will. So in the U.S., we have several sources of um, privacy. As, as Bill mentioned, you know, in the U.S., we don't have this sense of privacy um, and privacy laws that they have in Europe. And so we find that we do have a patchwork, if you will, um, of federal laws, FERPA being an example within higher ed, and state laws. There's a common law right of privacy, and then there are some state statutes for privacy. And then we also have some state statutes specifically for libraries that really do um, vary by state, and they do dictate the confidentiality of library records. However, those state laws often don't include um, library records that might be hosted by a third party, for example. And there is a list of various state laws on the ALA website. So if you're not familiar with your state law, I would suggest that you take a look there and really begin to understand what your state law says regarding privacy. So we also have institutional policies on privacy if you're in an academic institution. Um, however, much of our own library policies really are not stemming as much from um, a law as they are stemming from the ALA Code of Ethics. And essentially, the Code of Ethics has been the grounding of um, library policy for a number of years, and it's essentially protecting the library user's right to privacy and to confidentiality. And this goes to that core library mission of providing open and equal access to our collections. And we do this in order to enable education and free inquiry, those kind of cornerstones of a democracy. However, privacy is not absolute. And we have to balance user privacy with our other um, constraints around efficiencies, requirements of law enforcement, and then just plain old um, internet and security. So much of our privacy practices are really rooted in our history of deleting circulation records um, when somebody has returned a book. So they're really grounded in the days of almost complete print collections. However, technology has expanded both our collections and our services, and Gary's demonstrated how easy it is to track a user on the internet. So let's talk about doing a privacy audit for library services and what you might want to think about. So three questions that I think are worth asking is first of all, do you have a library privacy policy? Have you reviewed it lately? Um, does it pertain only to your print collections? Does it apply to online collections and take into account the changes that we've seen recently? 
Does it align with federal and state law and your institutional policies? I came up with, um, well, let me backtrack a tad bit. So I do want to say that policies are really important because they provide transparency and they do provide assurances to our users, but it's in implementing practices that I really think we can make the most difference. And I do think that we all have a role to play in that. And so I came up with kind of these three questions. Um, use them if they're useful to you. Um, but I don't think we always ask these questions when we should. And um, the first is, what data is being collected? I mean, Gary gave us examples that I don't think any of us were really always aware of. Who has access to that data? And then do users have the option to opt out? So putting that another way, can users search, access, and read anonymously? Or if they're using a particular service, are they actually automatically getting tracked in ways that they don't realize? So for systems librarians and technologists, really looking at ILS systems, search and discovery systems, mobile apps, library web pages, we need to consider what data is really being collected. How securely is it stored? How securely is it transmitted? Is personally identifiable information encrypted? For our vendor colleagues, have you tested your systems for vulnerabilities? If you provide hosting services, how securely is patron and user data stored? For those who do usability testing, of which, quite frankly, I am a big fan, um, I think we need to be aware for collecting personally identifiable information as part of usability testing. Realize that we probably need to be anonymizing that information. We need to make certain that the participants understand the parameters of the data collection and the use that we're going to make of that data. For scholarly communications librarians, most of our inter institutional repositories do have basic hit and download information, um, which is pretty generic and anonymized. But we do have some repositories that have um, sensitive data and other kind of things where you have to register as a user to actually download the files. And so how are we um, tracking that information, storing it? Do we delete it on a regular basis? For collections librarians, do you know what data the vendor of those collections and online materials is collecting? Is there digital rights management software attached to those files? How is that data collected used? With whom is it shared? Now, <clears throat> data collection is not in and of itself a bad thing. We in libraries need to know how our collections are used. We make collection decisions on a regular basis on use statistics that are provided from vendors. But do we need that information for each individual user, or is that information in the aggregate really what it is that we need to make those decisions? So for electronic resources librarians, are you negotiating for terms in your license agreements that protect user confidentiality and privacy? We can do by contract law what we don't necessarily in this country have laws to protect privacy for. For publishers and content providers, we need your help. We understand that you have a desire to track your content and how it's used, but we ask that you also understand that tracking and storing who is reading what is in direct conflict with our values and our ethics. And Catherine touched on this in her presentation as well. And Liaisons and subject librarians, I will echo what Gary has already said, that we really need to be teaching our users, including our faculty as well as our students, about privacy as part of information and digital literacy. So you have a very big role to play in educating users. We need to support our users' ability to make informed choices. I've used Facebook here as an example in part because they have improved their user privacy over the last several years 
often as a way of reacting to user feedback. And when I logged into Facebook a couple of days ago, it asked me if I wanted to review my privacy settings. So they've gotten more proactive in how they really approach privacy. But I think we in libraries really need to be proactive. We shouldn't be waiting for an incident or user demand to really be addressing user privacy. So for all of us, whether you're a librarian, a technologist, a publisher, or some combination of the three, you need to understand the contours of privacy law and our legal and ethical obligations. And most importantly, as Gary showed, we really need to understand how technology works, both to invade our privacy and to protect our privacy. We need to regularly question privacy implications of new tools and services. And we need to keep current, which I realize is a huge challenge, since technology is going to continue to change. So Gary's info docket is one great example of that. Um, the ALA Washington office is also another example where they regularly will have information about privacy. So finally, and most importantly, be an advocate. We all have a role to play. And I've given you this laundry list, not expecting you to go back to your institutions and do everything all at once. But my hope is that each of you can have a takeaway from this panel discussion, a to-do that you'll go back to your institutions and think about and consider. As our collections are becoming increasingly digital and our services are often hosted on platforms and servers even outside of our own institutions, our sensitivity to patron privacy really does need to increase. Fulfilling our library mission of providing equal and open access to our collections to enable education and to enable free inquiry relies on libraries remaining a trusted institution. When users recognize or fear that their privacy or confidentiality is compromised, then the freedom of inquiry no longer really exists. And that, I think, is the thing we need to guard against. Thank you. So we will have a bit of time for audience uh, involvement. But before we do that, let me ask a question. How many of you in this room have ever received a notice from a vendor, a credit card company, an institution to which you're connected saying, um, we're so sorry to let you know, but our records have been hacked. And you might be one of those people, and we're going to give you a year's worth of free credit reports or something. How many of you have had that happen to you? Quite a few. Yeah. Pardon me? Everyone but Gary. Everyone but Gary. Well, okay. I'm a cat. Yeah, I live off in a cabin. I mean, the, the Wi-Fi. You know, I've had probably half a dozen incidents like that over the last few years. The other thing I, I was thinking as I was listening to our speakers was that every couple of months or so I get from my bank or my credit card company or uh, some kind of service provider a notice saying, uh, here are our updated privacy policies, please read them. And the fact is that I don't. So <laughs> I think... Uh, some, some behavior adjustments uh, are, are called for just, just in our daily lives. Um, okay, I, we up front here can't really we, see you. We have you. a question here. Yeah. So, Anthony, give us, give us a hand. I can't really no, see he's here. Uh, he's here. what's Tell happening. Us. I have a question for Bill. Uh, uh, you mentioned Google and takedowns from Google, so information can't be easily found. But what about something like the Wayback Machine? Have they gotten takedown notices, too? Uh, in, in Europe? Yeah, I mean, all, all controllers of data in Europe uh, have the same obligation that Google does. I mean, they, Google is the one that got actually sued, but the but the privacy rules apply to all um, controllers of data, uh, personal data in Europe, and so any other search engine would be required to do the same sort of thing. In terms of numbers, I don't know how many 
how many that particular uh, search engine has had, but all of them are, are doing it now. We have another question there, Bob Holly. Okay, Bob Holly. Uh, this is Sir Lisa. Uh, when we talk about library policies, it suddenly struck me that I'm getting unencrypted email reminders of things that I need to renew, which definitely ties what I'm reading to uh, my name. I wrote an article about it. It's been downloaded 2,500 times. Uh, according to the institutional repository, but there apparently is no traction on libraries' part because it's something they want to do. So are you asking why libraries aren't... Um, I'm a bit curious why when, this, when uh, an e-book provider did exactly the same thing, there was a fur, and there were all these complaints about their doing it, when there is evidence that the library did it, it seems as if suddenly privacy isn't important anymore. Mm. Yeah, and I think um, one of the things that we in libraries really do need to step up the plate with is the data that we collect. Because with authentication, we collect a lot of data about our users, and we're not necessarily anonymizing that in ways that we should be. We're not as sensitive to what we know about our users in the electronic world in the same way that we kind of routinely erase circulation records. And why that is, I'm actually not certain. I think some of it is that we have become a bit inured to the whole idea of privacy as we get these notices saying that, you know, your credit card has been um, hacked, etc. And so I think we unfortunately somewhat look at ourselves as being the exception. Um, we do have a, a different role than a business in that we are, you know, an educational institution and we're often a trusted entity. And I think my concern that because we're not directly addressing our own practices, we can lose that, that trust um, when it becomes known that we have not done what we should have or could have um, to protect our patrons' privacy. And I, I just suggested that perhaps this should be an opt-in procedure and should not be automatic. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that gets to Gary's point about user education. Um, a lot of our users don't necessarily know when they're using a service that it requires them to log in in some way. It's great to have that personalization, but it can come at a cost. And so the ability to be able to do things anonymously is important. Do you want to no, I just want to say, too, it's not only teach, as I said earlier, not only teach our users, but also teach our colleagues. Yeah. I think sometimes um, that could be a major part of the issue that a lot of people, some people understand what's going on and are aware of it, but not everybody. And you, you really often have to have everybody on the same page yeah. to get something implemented. So uh, in the interests of time here, we haven't been able to have a publisher on the panel. But I'm wondering if there's a, a brave and an interested publisher in the audience who might talk about how you're thinking about these matters because I, I believe uh, that you are, but it's not a perspective we've heard here. Is there somebody who might make a comment about what you th how you think about this in your organizations? I don't see anyone swarming Adam, up. Adam, do, do you have any knowledge? Adam? Adam, do you have any? No. I can't see the other publishers, they're too far away. Um, no, it doesn't look hopeful. <laughs> I have a question if you'd like one. Shall I ask a question? Please. My question is, would you like to see a, a right to forget in the American legal system? All three of you. You shouldn't ask lawyers these questions, I know, but I don't see why not. <laughs> well, you know, to get around the right to f be forgotten, if you often, publicizing the fact that an article has been removed makes the article, like you were explaining, you know, people write stories about the articles. I believe the BBC publishes a list every month of all the URLs that they remove, but the story is still there. And quite frankly, it's not very difficult using one of a number of services. If I'm in Denmark, let's say where I just was, and I want the US version of Google.com, 
I can fire up one piece of software, not very expensive, in some cases free, and I can go directly to the US version of Google. So I, I, I personally think that a lot of this is, unless it's a worldwide and everybody respects it, and you also get to the question about the Wayback Machine, you're making sure that Brewster and his team are removing all the URLs. The information is still out there, um, for the most part, if you want to find it. And it's not very difficult to find. Bill? Well, that's, I mean, that, that's the thrust of the French agency, privacy agency's ruling, which is it is awfully easy to get around it, and we don't want you to get around it. So we're going we're gonna to make our, our ruling applicable to all of your uh, extensions, is the way they describe them, to all of your, you know, Google dot ES, Google dot com, but, but I've seen databases of people who just collect all the right to be forgotten articles and put them up on their own site. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a, basically it's, we're creating a cat and mouse game. Because if somebody takes it down, somebody else will put it back up. It, it's, it's, it's a never-ending cycle here. Well, the fact that it, it may be difficult doesn't mean we ought not to do it. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally strongly believe in the right to be forgotten. I think the notion that if you had one bad picture of yourself at the fraternity party 20 years ago, it shouldn't still be on the web. Uh, you know, I think, I think there ought to come an end to it all and, and let a polite shade fall on your past. <laughs> Lisa? So I would agree that the right to be forgotten is important, but I wouldn't personally put it at the top of my list for libraries. I think digital rights management software um, and some of the ability to track what users do, to me, is a greater concern immediately. Um, and I also think it's something that we can actually begin to tackle ourselves and solve ourselves, whereas right to be forgotten legislation, I think would be difficult to get passed in the United States. So from a practical point of view, I'd like to see us work on some more issues that we can impact directly. post something to Facebook or to other social media sites, you can petition have it removed, for example, the picture. However, if somebody retweeted or reposted the picture, it doesn't apply to them. Uh -huh. So again, it's, it's this never-ending cycle. Well, yeah, you, I put up this picture, but my friend retweeted it. I can have it removed, but they won't remove the retweet. So you have the right to be partially forgotten. Partially forgotten, yeah. A little bit forgotten. <laughs> okay. right, right to fall into obscurity. Uh, we have time for one more. Thank you. Hi. Um, just a, a who, quick... Who are you? Sorry. Oh, um, Amanda Echterling, um, Virginia Commonwealth. Um, uh, and uh, my comment is um, regarding the discussion of... of of privacy, and this concept of functional privacy versus absolute privacy. I mean, if, if, it's, if it's scrubbed so much that you have to go almost to the dark web to, to find evidence of, is that, is that good enough? Um, uh, or, or are we you know, asking for absolute privacy in this digital context, which is, you know, uh, un, you know what, do, what, do you, what do we say, the um, perfect is the enemy of the good? Um, and then um, my other comment is that we've asked publishers to comment on this, but um, um, coming from a concept of acquisitions, the immediate um, uh, uh, conflict that I see is um, uh, under uh, our service providers and looking at um, the upcoming potential merger of an ILS with a content provider, um, an ILS that asks our students to register in order to receive all the full benefits of the ILS, and then that that content provider slash ILS provider having um, everything about um, a student down to the uh, content level all the way up to the ILS yes. level. I'm sure they'll, they but have you, something you to say about a, that, but it's I, a possibility. Your possible. question, yeah? You've asked your question, yeah. Well, I just want to say, I, I, don't, I think absolute privacy would be, is really not practical and probably not even doable. And my whole point when I was speaking was that, that the first thing we need to do is obviously learn about it and, and, and keep current. But, um, and as I said, everybody has a different comfort level. So we should make the comfort level of the, it's really almost an individual decision um, where they want to go. But, you know, absolute privacy would be basically turning the computer off, yeah. giving away your credit cards, probably not opening the door of your hotel room. 
I, I don't know how practical that is. I mean, so again, I just think the first place to begin is at the individual. One of the easiest places to begin would be at the individual level. So if you want absolute privacy, um, maybe you can live off the grid. I get That's a room me. in Montana. Yeah. Well, listen, thank you for your attention. And one of the things we'd like you to take away from the Charleston Conference is an awareness of these issues uh, as we return home and we go about our work. They really matter. Thank you.